Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. I'm Pete Crane, and I have the distinct honor of being the Vice President of Education and Access here at the National World War II Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the National World War II Museum's program commemorating the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Before we begin, I'd like to thank and recognize our friends, the Toby Philanthropies, for their generous sponsorship of tonight's program. This wonderful evening is part of the Toby Family Holocaust Educational Program that uh, we share with them. I'd also like to thank the Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra uh, and especially violinist uh, Philippe Quint for the performance of one of the Violins of Hope featured this week during its limited run in New Orleans. You know, little is known about the origin of this violin. It once belonged to a young Jewish boy who escaped from Poland to a small village in Belgium. Think about that. Across Belgium, across, Germ across Poland, Belgium, and Germany. Orphaned and alone, with only his violin for company, he sought refuge with a family in Brussels. One day he disappeared. Leaving behind his sole possession on the bed in his rented room, uh, eyewitnesses claimed that the German authorities rested, arrested him. You know, it's easy to become lost in the vast number of those murdered in the Holocaust. But the story of one young boy alone with a single possession, dependent on the mercy of strangers, brings the tragedy of the Holocaust home in a very personal way and makes the numbers, the vast numbers, slip away and become human. Now more than ever, it's critical that we share the experiences of those who perished and, or survived in the Holocaust to light. Increasingly, there are those who are either unaware or disbelieve the history of the Holocaust. And it's through events like tonight, our other educational programs, and the construction of our capstone exhibit hall, the Liberation Pavilion, which will have an exhibit about the Holocaust, that we can educate the next generation and bring meaning to the admonition, never again. This evening, we are grateful to have Stephen Hess join us to deliver the key keynote address. Mr. Hess and his twin sister were born in Amsterdam in 1938 to German Jewish refugees. The Hess family story is extraordinary in that they were able to stay together and survive together throughout their deportation. Following Nazi occupation, the Hess family was first taken to Westerbork, a Dutch transit camp, before being sent to Bergen-Belsen. There, they were among the 5% of Jews deported from Holland that survived to the war's end. That is, the 5% who survived to the war's end. The family moved to America in 1947, and after gaining a degree at the Columbia University and serving as a commissioned officer in the United States Navy, Stephen Hess has become an advocate for Holocaust education. I had the pleasure of spending time with Mr. Hess this afternoon and heard some of his incredible story. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Stephen Hess to the stage for his presentation. Ooh, the lights are bright. Thank you all, first of all, for inviting me. I make apologies for my twin sister who was supposed to join me, uh, but she had another commitment in her home in Washington, D.C. that she couldn't break. So I am here on behalf of us all. Before I, I get into uh, our story, I, I do want to, and thank you for that kind introduction. I, I do want to, emphasize, I, I've been teaching for 40 years as an, <laughs> for say a hobby, it's hardly a hobby, as an avocation. Uh, my background is as, as a businessman, uh, but after Reagan uh, went to Bitburg in 84, 85, I, I sort of had an awakening and realized of the enormity of what we had survived 
Uh, but on the other hand, growing up in America, I did not think much about anti-Semitism. I mean, you know, uh, we define it as a hatred, contempt, and fear of Jews as Jews. Uh, it was something in the past. It's the world's oldest hatred. It has a history of over 2,000 years. Uh, but very lately, uh, as was eloquently just referred to, uh, it has arisen not quite yet in full force, but obviously so. Uh, I, I received uh, uh, an email from Holland two days ago with a video that they uh, interviewed uh, several hundred Dutch citizens, uh, as all of you know, the home of Anne Frank, uh, also a country that has made its best efforts to portray itself uh, as uh, more well-behaved, more helpful to Jews, more sympathetic than any other country other than perhaps Denmark. Uh, the truth is quite somewhere, somewhere in the middle. Uh, that's as far as I'll say. But, but they interviewed several hundred people, and especially among uh, millennials, those under 40 years of age, the knowledge of the Holocaust was minimal. People couldn't identify Westerboro. Uh, if they were asked to name a concentration camp, uh, they couldn't name one. Uh, and there was a, a large proportion, about 27%, of outright deniers uh, uh, and revisionists, uh, just for educational purposes. Deniers, deniers hold that it never happened, and revisionists say, was hell, people die. Uh, so here in this country, in this country uh, that was uh, uh, in, in many ways at the core uh, of what had happened, the memory has faded. Uh, and it, it struck me in particular when people s say it never happened because n no one denies slavery uh, with, with all the, the bad things that happened, but no one denies it. Uh, no one de de denies the Civil War. No one denies World War I. No one denies the Revolution. No one denies the War of 1812, it's a given. But somehow it's okay to deny the Holocaust. Uh, that would, it, that's a lot more convenient. So the, the rise in anti-Semitism is worrisome, and uh, I ask you all to support this beautiful, wonderful museum uh, and to uh, educate those who may have questionable memories or no, no memories of what, of, of what it really means. Uh, I happen to have one of a hundred copies of the blueprints of the gas chambers at Auschwitz. Uh, for uh, some of you who may not be familiar with the, the history, let me just point out that nearly all, I can't put a percentage on it, nearly all of the historical information of the atrocities uh, of the Holocaust was written by Germans. The Jews were too busy being killed Except, the, except for the Ringelbaum letters that were buried in Poland in Warsaw and later discovered, uh, the documentation uh, was all German. Uh, I have a whole essay on the development of the gas chambers, uh, exactly what led to their development and how the, 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 the gas trucks, which were inconvenient and unreliable, led to, well, hey, we only need the engine, led to an engine outside of a farmhouse and somebody trying uh, a well-known uh, uh, product, Zyklon B, a pesticide, advertised in all the farming magazines, threw it in the window with 50 Russian POWs, and that was a eureka moment. Uh, they had finally reached the, capa the, ca the capacity of industrialized murder. So just keep in mind, these are not Jewish documents. These, these are not Jewish accusations. The Germans testified against themselves over a long period of time. Uh, the, the, the other thing I'd like to, in sort of a preliminary way, uh, give you a little thing in order to, one of the things about the, the Holocaust, and I said I've been reading it, studying it for 40 years, the more questions you ask, the weirder it gets. There's tons of questions, the answers, they don't keep coming. Uh, the facts co keep coming out, but the hows and whys, we know what happened, uh, but it's still truly unbelievable. 
uh, I'll get to my story, but uh, uh, one, of the one of the points I want to make is the Holocaust had to be invented. And by that I mean that there's no precedent for it. Uh, if we ever have another, another pandem pandemic, we have a good precedent, not a good one. We have a precedent. We have COVID, so we know at least what we should do, whether we do it or not. Uh, there was no precedent for the Holocaust. Therefore, it couldn't be imagined. It was totally beyond the imaginations. Uh, the other thing that's, that's, from a historical point of view, uh, good to note is that the Holocaust was not monolithic. Uh, it, it changed and varied from time and place and from the calendar year to calendar year. Uh, the most obvious uh, of many examples, I mean, yes, it was the Nazis' uh, ideological goal to murder every single Jew without exception, from every great-grandmother to every newborn baby. That was Hitler's point of view. There, there is no document that uh, he ever gave that order. It was understood as a, as a, a popular uh, quotation in a, a book about Hitler that the Germans were working their way towards Hitler. They were kept trying to more and more understand where he was coming from, but they understood perfectly well. Uh, Germany was a was a a country of about 60 million people uh, pre-war. I can't say all of them were Nazis, uh, but the support for if you watch the movies, uh, the support for uh, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis was unbelievable, especially among women uh, and the young. And if, you, and if you could possibly, which you can't, but if you could possibly imagine Adolf Hitler with no Holocaust, if you could possibly do that, which you can't, we know that. Uh, yes, he, he, brought, he led Hitler from a totally destroyed, demoralized country after a ruinous uh, Treaty of Versailles and, and a lost war and in un unbelievable infiltration and, and destruction, well, destruction not, destruction not that much, uh, to a prosperous nation. Uh, that's undeniable, if you could, uh, but of course you can't. So Hitler, uh, w when I used to travel uh, to Europe on business of a long time ago, I'm kind of past working now, uh, a long t time ago, I would never bring it up, but people wondered why I spoke poor German, and eventually uh, it came out, and I told them my background, and, and perfectly nice business people would, would look me in the face and said, I didn't know anything about this, tell me more. And they were, they were sincere, but this, the support for the Nazis was widespread until 1943, when the war wasn't going, you know, when you're a victor, things are easy to support. Uh, when you're a loser, it becomes more difficult. So to, uh, until 1943, the support for the Nazis uh, out of Hitler and his circle was widespread. Uh, and the other reason, and the other thing is, those who were opposed to it were silently opposed to it. It was in their thoughts. It was never spoken out because the one thing that, that the Nazis discovered early and well is a tool of terror. Uh, keep in mind that the first concentration camp Dachau was built only 90 days after Hitler assumed power. Uh, it, it was so bad that, that children at home, most of them in Hitler Jugend uniforms and Deutsche Mädel uniforms, were afraid, uh, their parents were afraid to talk about their opposition to the Nazi party in front of their children because the children went to school the next morning and the teacher said, Hans, what did you do yesterday? Oh, my parents were saying what a bad man Adolf Hitler was. And the next day, the SS would come knocking on the door. Terror is an incredibly effective uh, weapon, and it was invented early and used thoroughly and, and throughout, throughout the war. Uh, as, uh, as I said before, the Holocaust was not monolithic, even though the, ideo the ideology was. Uh, let me just give you two examples. Uh, Again, it varied from time and place. If you take uh, the war in Poland, and generally in the eastern countries, the war was particularly brutal. I mean, how brutal can it get? It was as brutal as it possibly could get. In Poland, for example, 95% of, of the Jewish population of about 3 million, 10% of the Polish population 
was, was wiped out, was murdered uh, at Sobibor uh, and the other five death camps. Uh, and the Nazis were totally brutal because the Polish, uh, under the Nazi ideology of the Übermensch and Untermensch, uh, and uh, the Aryan, or Aryan the, the Eastern Jews uh, were seen as Untermenschtum, as, as just above the Jews, but only a slight step. So in order to help a Jew in, in eastern uh, Poland, if, and there were some helpers, it wasn't always for uh, goodwill uh, or altruism, it was very often for money or for both, but it was very risky. If you were caught, your whole family was hanged off lampposts or, sh or, or, or shot or, or sent off uh, to Sobibor. Uh, so, so, and and the, the death toll showed it. But if you take the exact same time, the same war, the same Nazis, the same ideology, and you go to Denmark, well, uh, also, by the way, the, the Eastern Catholic countries were by default anti-Semitic. Uh, the, church, the, the church, the founding of the church, we can't get into it, it's too long, uh, had a lot to do with it. It's just simply undeniable. Anti-Semitism was a default. You go at the same time, to Denmark, uh, which was not a particularly religious country, uh, with a, at that time Jewish population of about 8,000. Uh, their neighbors were not Jews, they were their neighbors. Uh, the Nazis, also the Danish themselves, met the standard of the Aryan. They were typically you know, light-skinned, blonde, blue-white, whatever, uh, as were many of the Western European countries. So they were seen as the right kind of people. The Nazis did not hate, every, hate everybody. They didn't have time for that. So the, the occupation in Denmark uh, was, was fairly relatively mild. Uh, and the Nazis, the SS, and the German diplomats uh, who were stationed in Denmark regularly kept the Jewish community informed of what was happening. When finally Hitler insisted that the Danish Jews be deported, the, 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 the local German authorities tipped off the Jews uh, between Denmark and, and Sweden. They managed over two nights to ship all 8,000 uh, Jews of Denmark over to Sweden uh, for, in safety. So Sweden lost maybe 50 people during the war, same war, same everything, except it was different. So w when you judge it, it's, it, it's easy to say they killed everybody everywhere. It all, it, a, a lot depended on the situation. Obviously, if, if a country was invaded later or if you were deported later, you had a better chance of survival. But the point is, it was not monolithic. It was much more complicated than that. The next thing is people often ask me, how come you're here? How come you survived? And that's a question I've never been able to answer because, th again, the ideology was to stamp out the, ja the last Jewish life without exception. So why am I standing here? And the only answer I have ever come up with, and even my twin sister disagrees, but that's okay, uh, is luck. Uh, because if, if the Nazis were determined to murder everybody, then why wasn't everybody murdered? Well, it's luck, but the problem with luck is it's not evenly distributed. It's better to be young than to be old. Tell me about it. It's better to be rich than to be poor. It's better to be smart than to be stupid. Uh, it's, it's better to be good looking than not, not so much. Uh, but th the real thing that luck is not evenly divided. Uh, and of course you can't control that. So one of the things that, that that I ascribe to our survival, even though it was never really in our control, was the fact that we were the children of, of extraordinary parents. Uh, this still chokes me up after 80 years. I should get used to it, but that's the way it is. Uh, our parents were well educated. My father was a successful businessman. Uh, my mother was the much adored a single daughter of a successful merchant in Recklinghausen, 
uh, they met accidentally on a, on, a, on a business call my father made to, to her father. My father was uh, 13 years older. That her parents were not impressed, but nevertheless, love conquers all, uh, and they eventually married. Uh, they were both very strong-willed in a positive way. They were relentless. Uh, you, you could not control your survival in a concentration camp. It was totally, I mean, yes, there were things, people, everyone tried and everyone tried to live, but ultimately, if they put you in a gas chamber or up against the wall, all your choices are gone. Uh, but some people gave up, uh, some people just like, burned out, some people said, there's, there's no hope. My parents never did that. They had, they had made a pact early when, when the Nazis invaded Holland uh, in May of 1940. Uh, my parents, after a while, uh, decided that, that they would hide us, my, my twin sister and I, uh, underground for which they had to pay. And they also had to pay for another family that couldn't afford it. And at the, uh, at the last second, my mother said, I mean, they had paid for it, they had been arranged. It was very difficult to go underground as a family with, with two babies or tod toddlers because the toddlers make noise. Uh, and, and the underground would, simply wouldn't take them. But bef just before they, they were going to go, my parents said, we are staying together. And that was it. Had, had they known what was going to happen, the decision might have been different. But they made a decision to, to just stay together, uh, come what may. But again, in the Holocaust, nobody could look over the horizon. It had never happened before. You couldn't even begin to imagine it. Uh, when Hitler came to power, there was, there, there, there was no uh, barrier for the Jews uh, of Germany uh, to, leave Germ to leave Germany because uh, uh, Hitler wanted to make Nazi Judenrein clean of Jews and raus mit the Juden. Uh, so why would he possibly want them? He wanted to get rid of them. But rid of them in the beginning was extrusion. The Holocaust was, was such a forethought that while people may have thought it, they weren't ready for it. It required war, it required cooperation, it required commitment, all sorts of things. That was way off. So when, when the Nazis and Hitler said, Juden raus, extrusion. But the problem was nobody wanted the Jews. America didn't want the Jews. Canada didn't want the Jews. Australia didn't want the Jews. Nobody wanted the Jews. Uh, so getting out was very difficult. The other problem was you couldn't take anything other than small change in your pocket. If you had a business, a house, and a, and a Mercedes, you'd just leave all the keys on the, on the desk next to the door and go, and, and goodbye. And about a quarter million uh, German Jews made that decision and got out with nothing. They went to Shanghai. Uh, a few went to America, uh, Canada, hardly any. Uh, the only place that, you, that was somewhat open if you had enough money uh, was South America. Uh, you, you could buy your way in there. So there, were, there, was, no, there was no barrier for Jews getting out of Germany. But in the, but in the meantime, uh, come 1935, the situation for the Jews was becoming so tenuous uh, in Germany uh, that the future was inc incredibly bleak. And my, my father had, in the meantime, uh, paid passage and arranged passage for his parents to go to America as able to get a visa. And by the way, in those days, you didn't cross the border and the American taxpayer paid the bill. It was a little bit different. You applied for a visa. It took a year. You, you, had, to you had to pledge and demonstrate and show proof that you would not be a burden on the American taxpayer. Somebody else, a relative, a friend, had to prove that they would be responsible for you. And, it was, and the quotas were never filled. Uh, but yes, nevertheless, nevertheless, a quantity of Americans, uh, Germans came to America, including my, uh, my father's parents, my grandparents, uh, which my father took, took care of. My, my, my mother's parents uh, refused to leave Germany. They were very devoted 
to the Jewish community. Uh, unfortunately, Jews are used to anti-Semitism, and the response is, this too shall pass. You get, you know, you, you, you get used to anything. And they, again, without a precedent, this too shall pass. This is the Hitler time, it will pass. But of course, we, we now know better. So my, my, my mother's parents uh, refused to leave Germany, and they died. Uh, uh, my father, uh, on the other hand, uh, did, he was successful. He was, he was, he was, an, he was an elegant, elegant man. He, he was an equestrian. He was, he was a ballroom dancer. Uh, he had a, a high-level job. He really wasn't all that prepared to give it all up because as, as wise as he was, and he was, he also could not look into the future. So, but looking around, the obvious place was to go was to Holland because World War II was really a continuation of World War I. Uh, World War I never really ended. It just took a, it took, it, it took a while to put the two pieces together, but no, no World War I, no, no Hitler, that's for sure. Uh, but Holland had been neutral in World War I. And, and also remember that in, 19, in the mid-30s, uh, World War I was right in the rearview mirror. I mean, I'm, I see there's, there are many who are, there, everyone's younger than I am, but there are many senior citizens here. Vietnam, I was 40 years ago, and, and, and most of us remember it like it, it happened last week. So World War I was such a fresh memory. Not only that, it was visible all over. In those days, people without limbs, without, without arms, without legs, and what the French called the faceless ones, the ones whose faces were so badly damaged, they had to wear metal masks. It was, there was proof all over, and Europe did not want another war and did everything to avoid it, including giving into, in, into, in, into Hitler. So, uh, and again, Holland was neutral, and there was every expectation uh, that Holland would be neutral again. Why? Because it was neutral in World War I. It made sense at the time. Holland declared its neutrality uh, in 1914, and, and everyone believed it would be neutral again. Uh, so my father's employer, they were not Jewish, but they were good people, they were good Germans, uh, they were sympathetic, they arranged for my father to be transferred to take over the office in, in Amsterdam. This was a multinational, a silk company, uh, and for the manager of the office in Amsterdam, who was not Jewish, to come back, to transfer back to Germany, problem solved. Even better, because, I mean, Germany was a, was a country of laws, most of them pretty bad, but nevertheless, a country of laws. Uh, under the laws, uh, a company could legally transfer an, em uh, an employee. So my father had a legal uh, transfer to Holland. Uh, I, I remember very well, years ago, my mother asked whether I would speak to, she had a very heavy accent, and a wonderful, wonderful woman. And she said, with her accent, she said, Stephen, will you speak to my senior citizens group? And I was in front of a, of a, a, a whole room full of blue-haired ladies, uh, gray, blue-haired, or none. And I said, in 1937, my parents fled Germany. And my mother said, Stephen, we didn't flee. We left legally. And I said to my mother, you're such a German. And, uh, but, but, but they did. They were able to take their stuff. My father went to, like a co corporate transfer back in the 50s and 60s. I come from Rochester, Kodak, transferred everybody in two years, executives. Uh, my father went ahead and took over the Dutch office. My mother stayed, be my mother stayed behind to pack up the house because it was, it was a legal uh, transfer, which included the furniture and stuff like that, but nothing of value. I was talking about luck before. Here's luck. M my mother was a particularly beautiful woman. A lot of sons say that their moms were beautiful. But my mother really was. She was just a gorgeous woman. And uh, as she got to be my age a long time ago, I wanted to get more information. I was dying. I, I would have memories at night, and I'd I, I, I jot on the table, and I'd ask my mother. 
I won't say nightmares. I had this thought or dream that we were here, here, and here, and my mother, I just wanted more information, and my, and my mother uh, only had, th had three answers to whatever I asked her in her heavy German accent that ne never changed. I would tell her, Mom, I remember th we, we were in this, this place and that place, and this happened. And she would say, Stephen, I don't remember this at all. And I would hit the delete button. Or my mother would say, oh, yes, but, but you have it wrong. It was in a different place. And I would say, Mom, tell me about it. And I'd, I'd, I'd get my, my memory straightened out. Or very often, uh, to my benefit, she'd say, that's exactly right. And I said, tell me more. Uh, so I was very careful. When you, when you talk about this, you want to make sure that you have your facts straight. I did this for years, uh, but uh, I, to my great regret, I didn't do it long enough or, or early enough. Uh, in fact, when the other thing, my, my mother was also very observant and had a lot of in, insight and was introspective. And, and uh, my mother said, because of when, when, the German, when the German Jews fled from Germany to, uh, to Holland, uh, they were not particularly welcome. Uh, by the Dutch Jews. And my mother once looked at me and we were talking about it and she said something that was, that was of course ridiculous but showed a lot of the, the horror that people and the terror that people felt. And she said to me, Stephen, if the German Jews had only stayed in Germany, they wouldn't have, Hitler would not have chased them over the Dutch border, saying if the German Jews had stayed where they were, Dutch neutrality would have been respected. Uh, because there's quite, you know, we, of course, there are many genocides, unfortunately, but, but most of them are internationally within borders, within a country. But, but the Holocaust was totally different where, where, the, where the Nazis chased the Jews to whatever country they could get to. It wasn't an, an internal political uh, or, or ideological fight. It, it was a a fight for world domination and a fight to to get the, these Jewish vermin uh, out of this world. So it, it that's why uh, my 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 twin sister wrote uh, an op-ed for the L.A. Times a while back, and uh, and she used the word genocide, and I and I said Marion. Actually, I call her Zis. It's it's a Dutch diminutive for Zisia, for sister. I said Zis, you don't ever compare anything. To the Holocaust, it is it is uniquely by is unique by interpretation, and we had a bit of a, a tussle about that. But but I feel strongly about it. You cannot say it, it was another genocide. It was unique in many ways. Uh, in May 1940, uh, uh, the the Nazis invaded the Low Countries, and uh, by that time, my parents were trapped. They had uh, they they had two. Uh, a, a set of twins. Uh, you couldn't get out anymore. My father had made the wrong decision because he believed in history uh, and what had happened would, would be a guidance to the future and so we were trapped. And, and, and the, the Nazis brought the, uh, the anti-Jewish laws, the Nuremberg laws, uh, all the laws to, to Holland immediately. But the worst thing about the Nazi occupation, uh, other than the obvious loss of uh, of a hundred and over, well over a hundred thousand Dutch Jews, and the survival of less than one percent, less than five percent of them, less than five thousand, including my uh, my family, but the what, what made it so impossible for Dutch Jews to escape was that the occupation uh, was a civil occupation as opposed to a military obligation. The Dutch monarchy fled to London, so no more leadership, but the Dutch bureaucracy, the banks, uh, the law enforcement, the courts, all remained on their jobs and doing the, the Germans' bidding 24-7. Uh, every single policeman stayed, well, I can't say it, every, the policeman stayed at, reported for work in the morning, took their orders from the German, may not have liked it, but they, they did their work. When the Jews were arrested, the Dutch police always came along. 
very often because of a language, they didn't speak Dutch, or, uh, so they, they, needed, uh, they needed a Dutch and a German uh, arrestor to, uh, to communicate. Uh, but when we were picked up, there was a Dutch policeman uh, right there. Uh, so it was also Holland is a very small country, twice the size of New Jersey, uh, bordered to the south by occupied El El Belgium, uh, on the west by the by the N North Sea, uh, and to the east by Nazi Germany. Uh, so it was a, it's a flat land. There are no mountains to speak of. Uh, there was no place to hide. Uh, again, the, of the population of about 140,000 Jew, Jews in Holland, not all Dutch, out of a population of 9 million, about 110,000. When, when the figure of 75% of Dutch Jews, which is usually quoted in books, uh, is mentioned, uh, I must say the figure is wrong uh, for this reason. About 35,000 Jews from in Holland, including uh, a certain amount of of, of German Jews, French Jews, Polish Jews, quite a few, uh, were not arrested and deported. Therefore, as long as that situation continued, they were not in, Im in immediate fear of being murdered. But of, of so about, uh, and about a third of them were betrayed, uh, e either uh, for many reasons, uh, personal jealousies, uh, partnerships gone wrong, anti-Semitism, it, it was all sorts of things. So a third of, of the 35,000 Jews in Holland who, who were not arrested and deported, but who went into hiding, a third of them were, were betrayed uh, and, and, and were subsequently dep deported. But of the 110,000 that they were deported to the concentration camps, fewer than 5% survived. So I prefer to think that the survival in Holland was, was closer to 5% than to 25%. My parents tried several escape attempts. The first was, uh, the, the first was uh, right after the Germans invaded. My father had, a, had a, his car in front of the door packed. I mean, people had a sense that this was late because they'd been, the war had started in September 1st, 1939. And, he w and uh, my father packed us into the car, headed for the Dutch port of Jumeriden. Uh, uh, as, as many other uh, German and Jewish refugees did, because the, supposedly there was a ship there uh, that would take us to the safety uh, of England. Uh, we were most of the way there. We was, and my parents, by the way, important, were stateless. They were, certainly weren't German citizens. They had lost that in 1935 with the Nuremberg Laws, and they certainly weren't Dutch citizens. As a side remark, I looked into getting Dutch citizenship uh, last year at the advice of a good friend of mine. She says, why don't, you, why don't you get Dutch citizenship? And I actually looked into it. Why not? I'm Dutch. I was born there. I can't get Dutch citizenship because you have to have a Dutch mother in order to get it. That made a lot of sense. So I didn't and I wouldn't. Uh, anyway, uh, so my father made the, the attempt to get to the coast. They were stopped by the police, the Dutch police. Your papers, please. My parents had no papers. They were stateless. And they were turned around, and they went back to uh, their apartment. It, was, it, it all happened within a certain number of hours, so their, their apartment had not been pulsed, a word you've never heard before. The Germans subcontract everything, and, and they subcontracted uh, the emptying of Jewish apartments after the Jews were arrested to a, uh, a Dutch a moving company like Mayflower or Allied Movers, and the name of the com company was was a, a the initial A Pulse. And I once showed my mother some photographs of Holland during the war, and my mother said that that house is being pulsed. And I said, "What does that mean?" She said, "The moving wagon. The Germans hired the Pulse company to empty the apartments the second they arrested the Jews. The Pulse company got a phone call or a form or whatever." Uh, and said, empty apartment so-and-so, uh, and immediate. So if you were arrested, within days your apartment had been, uh, had been pulled. The other thing with the, the, with the civil occupation, uh, 
was so different, again, the, the Nazis totally controlled uh, the bureaucracy. Uh, for non-Jews, life sort of continued. Uh, and, but the Dutch were working. I mean, yes, there was a resistance, but, but not, not enough. And, and you, can't, you cannot expect uh, anyone to be a hero or, or to risk the, their lives or the lives of their family, uh, their children, or their, their, their loved ones. That, that, that's just not fair. Uh, but a, a bigger problem was betrayal. That's voluntary. Uh, the Germans paid a bounty for every Jew that was betrayed, uh, under $100, I think it was $70. Uh, so if it was very hard, it was very hard to stay hidden. You know, children go out, they play, and and or somebody said that's weird. This people, the people next door, are getting twice the milk jars they used to get, listening to the walls. It 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 was difficult to hide, and betrayal, which was voluntary, no, nobody forces anybody to to betray somebody, was a huge factor uh, in in Holland. Uh, so they. The story of Anne Frank, uh, which every child reads and thinks Holland was, was the country of tulips and wooden shoes, uh, they obviously don't know what happened to Anne Frank. The, deport the, the, the deportation started in 1942. Why? Uh, it's interesting if you, if you read it, everything has a why. Uh, the why was that the, that the Nazis, as I had re referred to, really didn't know. It was, the operation was chaotic. Everybody was trying to do what they thought was expected to do, and, and it took the Nazis nearly two years to murder the Jews of Eastern Europe, the industrial murder of Eastern Europe. You know, they, start, they, they, short, they, they started with the Einsatzgruppen, uh, four German, 3,000 soldiers apiece, uh, a lot of them uh, former policemen, that followed the army after Barbarossa and the invasion uh, of Russia, and they were right behind the German army, and they they come to a captive town or a shtetl in all Jewish cities, and Russia was very anti-Semitic, and Jews tended to live in shtetls, Jew Jewish towns, they couldn't mix with the population, uh, and gather all the Jews, walk them into the woods and shoot them all. Babi Yar, uh, 34,000 Jews shot to death within 24 hours. Uh, and the local population would come out with their children and watch the shooting with, with an ice cream cone in their hands. And the Germans thought that this was a little sloppy and eventually it led to the development of, of, of mass murder by, uh, by poison gas. But it started, it started with the, with the, the Einsatzgruppen. Uh, in, in, in Holland, again, the, the deportations did not start till 1942 until the Germans had developed industrial murder uh, and had pretty much killed off the Jews of Eastern Europe. But in uh, 1942 came along and the, the Low Countries, including Holland, uh, was next. And uh, when the, just before the war started, the Dutch had built a camp. The, the Dutch did not, did not want to refuse uh, the escaping Germans. I mean, unlike border crossings, won't get into politics. Un un unlike that, these people were were absolutely fleeing for their lives. Uh, they were going to be murdered, and they knew it. So there's there's a difference. So so the Dutch did not want to take that harder line of not accepting people who were who who were about to be murdered, and with the Dutch with the Jewish agreement that they would eventually pay for it, the Dutch built a camp on the Dutch side in northeast Holland, on the Dutch side of the Dutch-German uh, border uh, called Westerborg. Uh, and that was filled uh, at the time by approximately 10,000 uh, German Jews. Westerborg was not a concentration camp. It was a holding center. It was a refugee camp. But once the Nazis invaded Holland uh, and the Endlösung, the, those are, I always use quotes because they're German words, I don't like to use them, but when the final solution started in Holland, the Nazis said, how convenient. We have this camp right on the border and they turned the purpose of, of this refugee camp into a, 
in a, a camp to deport the Jews. And then on most evenings, the Dutch went out and arrested Jews. The, all the Jews had a regis register. If you didn't, you literally took your life in your hands. You would be deported right away. It's extremely, extremely risky. Uh, when they started deport deporting the Jews, they took them first to a theater. Uh, it used to be the, the Dutch theater. Then it became the, uh, the Jewish theater. And when uh, the Nazis took over, it became known as the Schauberg, uh, a, a, a big theater without seats. And, and most evenings, the Nazis had, the, had what were called razias, which were, it sounds like raids, and they were raids, but the word doesn't mean raids, but the word meant razias. And they'd have these nightly razias, brought the Jews to the Schauberg, the Dutch theater, where they housed them for a day. My father uh, and, his, uh, and, and his co-workers uh, were incredibly heroic because they, they were able to get hundreds of Jews out because of the chaos. Uh, and they would open this. My father worked there. He had a work assignment there. Uh, and they would, they, they would, where the opportunity presented itself, allow Jews to escape through a side door when the Nazis were not particularly observant. And the risk was, and they were told never to mention how they got out, out of the Schauberg. But where did they go? They went, they went first back to their home. Because that was a natural inclination. Across the street was a place called the Kirsch. It was a, a foundling home. And the Nazis al al allowed nursing mothers to cross the wide street with a tram in between to go nurse their babies in the Kirsch. So my, my, uh, my father and his accomplices, is all done at, done at night, would wait until the tram came and that the Nazi guard, guards couldn't actually see across the street and take nursing mothers up to the age of 70 quickly across the street and, and managed to get their babies and the babies, with the, also with the cooperation of a, of a school next door, took these babies in sacks and in bags uh, in whatever uh, away and, and gave them to the underground and, and hundreds were saved. Interesting story was after the war, uh, so, uh, quite a few these rescuers, uh, they had the kids baptized and, re and refused to return the children. And there were many court proceedings and some the Jews lost, they lost their own children, but there are all, so there are all, all sorts of stories. It took the Nazis about a year and a half to make, uh, to make Holland Judenrein, clean of Jews, uh, deporting them all to, nearly all, to Westerborg. Westerborg was not a concentration camp, as I said. It was a holding center, and it, it was survivable. It was surrounded by barbed wire. It was guarded by the Dutch police. Uh, there was some back and forth between the cities and Westerborg. It was part of Holland. Uh, it, was, it was governed by a, a, a German officer, uh, but it was not a concentration camp. Uh, but everybody, but the, the horror about, uh, about Westerborg was that every Tuesday, reliably as a clock, a train filled with approximately 1,000 Jews left for the East, never to be seen again. There were four destinations. Uh, there was Auschwitz, uh, which, to which about 67,000 Jews from Holland and from Westerbork were shipped, and of whom about 1,000 were alive at the end of the war. There was Sobibor, where about 35,000 Jews from Holland were shipped, of whom 19 were alive at, at the end of the war. There was Theresienstadt, supposedly a model concentration camp, but it was but really a gateway to Auschwitz, and a very few returned. And then there was Bergen-Belsen, uh, which was in the northern part of Germany uh, that people did not know, know much about. The, 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 the camp of Westerwald was, uh, was run by German Jews because they were the first ones there. Uh, so my, my father uh, and mother decided, let's try and they, they had to take a train. Uh, they, you couldn't stay in Westerwald. And they just picked, just say, well, Bergen-Belsen is in Germany. We know Bergen-Belsen. 
we'll, we'll take our chances, and that chances saved our lives because Berg and Belson uh, did not have gas chambers. People died from, from typhus, uh, exposure, uh, of course, starvation, and any disease you could, uh, you could name. So on, so on February uh, 15, 1944, we were taken to Berg and Belson. Uh, we are, it was a one-day trip. Normally, when these trains went to the concentration camp, approximately 10% of the people in the cars, they were all cattle cars, they held between 50 and 70 people each. Uh, the trains going to Sobibor, uh, Auschwitz took about six days. Approximately 10% of the Jews inside the locked cars were dead. Dead because they were old, they were sick, uh, there, there was no food, there was no water, and of course there were no toilet facilities. Uh, so the cars were also filled by dead people. We were, we were shipped to Bergen-Belsen, which was approximately a one-hour trip. I, I have it, it set up, I want to just, he, he, here's the Netherlands, again, surrounded uh, by enemy-occupied uh, countries and the Northern Sea, sort of escape-proof. My mother and father, my father was, was blonde and blue-eyed. I, I once told him he looked more like a Nazi than a Nazi. He did not, he did not appreciate it, but he did. And in, 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 in many ways, it probably saved our lives. And I said, my, my mother was a particularly beautiful woman, and, and, and you know, men, very, you know, they, she got a little more respect than somebody else. And especially when, when my mother was packing our stuff to go to, go to uh, Holland, uh, a policeman was at the apartment every day to make sure my mother uh, would not be packing valuables. My mother related this to me, and I, she, she said, and she said, Stephen, I played him like such a fish. And I said, what does that mean? And she said, I would say, the policeman, to I don't know what his name was, Herr Schmidt, would you like a, a cup of coffee? And, and he said, oh, nein danke, nein danke, Frau Herr, no wollen Sie ein Butterbrot, would you like a sandwich? Oh, nein danke. And my mother, age 80, would say, I knew he wasn't looking at my packing. And at the same time, she was rolling up the silverware in the linens that we were allowed to take, and much of that, not all of it, uh, survived the war. And this was, this was on the beach in Holland, and I said to my mother, why are you, that's the cute one. My, mo my mother's holding me, that's the cute one. My sister's, my sister's playing on the sand. Yeah, this, this is the beach in, in, in Holland. And uh, I, I'm the historian in the family. I said to my mother, why are you smiling? The, the, 1939, the war's gonna break out two or three months. And she said, what are you talking about? We're safe, we have two wonderful children. Dad has a good job and Holland is neutral. Well, uh, a few months later, it was different. Uh, again, the invasion of Holland, uh, the Dutch army was next to nothing. Six days of resistance, a large Naz Nazi movement in Holland. Uh, and uh, the Dutch merchant philosophy of going along to get along. Hitler's idea was to incorporate Holland like he did uh, Austria into the greater German Reich. He, 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 he saw Holland as the right kind of people as long as he got rid of the Jews. Uh, that, 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 that's us for in Earth costumes, which our nanny brought us. There's a long story, but the death of Mr. Fisher, I found out that the photographer's name was, was uh, Fisher. Now I know much more about him. Uh, he was caught by the Germans making false uh, photo photographs for ID papers, and they, uh, he, along with 18 others, were shot on the beach in Sreveningen. So I always think of M Mr. Fisher. And here's Westerborg, and you see the railroad track. Uh, it, it, this is right on the Dutch side. You see the railroad track going through the middle, and every Tuesday, the train was filled, was filled with a th approximately 1,000 Jews. Our train held 773 J Jews in Febru February 15, 1944. This was Westerborg. I always think of it as a, as a frontier town. It was dirty flies, uh, but it was, it was safe. There were the Jews, you know, you know, the best and the brightest were there. There were uh, composers and, and, and academics and, and, and scientists 
uh, to the Nazis, they were all just Jews, but there was a lot of brain power there. Uh, so the Dutch set up schools for the kids. There were actually was a small symphony orchestra that the Nazis would like music, would, would happily attend. Uh, so it was safe, but it was pretty dirty, pretty filthy, but you weren't starving and you weren't being murdered. Here, oh, here, here are the trains, and you could see uh, from what I just re related, only five out of 110, only 5,000 people survived, and eight of hundred of them were still in Westerborg, so they were not in immediate danger. This, is, this was at West Westerborg, uh, that photograph. These were the cars uh, that waiting, on, waiting on the railhead on a Tuesday for the condemned Jews. Uh, the Nazis used to say 45 minutes door to door from the time the train door opened to the time the gas chamber door closed. Uh, we're talking about Auschwitz and Sobibor in, in particular. I, I find this photograph touching. You see that little baby there. She would be dead in, within 24 hours, maybe within a couple of days. You see a little girl being in the back of the train. The train is crowded with people, and all these people uh, met their death within, within a week, with very, very few exceptions. Uh, again, whether the, the red arrow is at Bergen-Belsen, uh, and uh, Westerborg is just to the left of it, but on the other hand, it, if you look at Poland, on the right side were all the death camps, so that was a much, a much longer trip. Bergen-Belsen was a huge camp. We were in a, in a place called the Sternlager, which is a star camp because we all wear the Jewish star and not the striped uniforms. We were supposed to be privileged, we're called the Prominenten, uh, Jews who had contacts with, uh, uh, with uh, other countries, uh, Jews who had fake passports, which my parents had, who had purchased to a neutral countries, especially Paraguay uh, and other uh, South uh, American countries, and they were supposed to be, be kept for barter, either for exchange for uh, German assets held overseas or for, for POW exchanges. That only happened twice, uh, but Germans thought that, that, that we had some value uh, for exchange. But there was a, there was a, a woman's camp, there, there was a Ru Russian uh, POW camp, a small camp, uh, also at, uh, at that time in November 1944, Anne Frank and her sister Margot uh, arrived from Auschwitz and lasted till March and died. These, here, here are the camps, all separated by the barbed wire. You see the, 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 these huts, they were unheated in the harsh winters. Uh, these photographs, by the way, were all taken after the war uh, by, the, by the British Army. Uh, people slept, but even words like sleeping have no meaning unless, unless you were there. People rested as best they could on these, on these wooden bunks and there was no heat, but there was, at the end, at the end there was a, 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 a pot-bellied stove, but there was no fuel. So what we all, what we did, we would take a plank out of the, out of these, let's call them beds, out of these bunks, uh, and then move the other planks to even out for the spacing, and everybody contributed a plank to the stove to get some heat, but that didn't last. So everybody took another plank out, and, and that required adjusting the other plank to fill up for the space. That only worked for so long until you, you, your, your body, bones and all, would just sag between planks and then it didn't work at all. But that's, that's how summer heat got into the barracks. When, uh, life in the concentration camp, our parents, uh, we had to get up at about five o'clock for a Pell, uh, which, which was assembly, which took two or three hours People died just standing there, and they were just sim simply collapsed. Uh, and they were, it, it was for uh, roll call. And, and if, if the count wasn't right, they'd do it again, and people died. But to us, it was, it was all normal. Uh, after that, the, those who could work were sent to slave labor. My mother went to a shoe factory where they recycled shoes, mostly from Auschwitz, uh, into good parts and bad parts in a tent in the freezing winter. You know, it was horrendous work. My father was, was assigned to a ditch digging detail, and one day he was beaten so badly 
that, that, that he begged to be shot. He was, my, my, because my father looked Scandinavian, he, he looked Nordic, blonde, blue-eyed, the Germans couldn't figure out, and he was German. He didn't speak German, he was German. So they always put him in charge of these work groups. And, and he was in charge of one of the work groups. And when the German guard passed, my father would tell the workers, the other prisoners, shovels down, relax, take a breath. One day that didn't work, a guard caught him. They beat him so badly that he begged to be shot. The, the German sergeant's name was Rau. My father later testified at the Belton trial against, against a, a, a capo who was hanged on October 10th, 1946. I have his death warrant on my wall as a souvenir. Uh, so uh, every, every morning first came roll call, then all the dead people, of which there were always many, were pulled out of the barracks. People stole whatever clothing they could have, that they could, they could get. Uh, you were fed a two centimeters, I don't know why you centimeters, I can't do the conversion, uh, two centimeters of moldy bread, which they mixed with sawdust when they baked because they didn't have enough flour, uh, and a watery coffee that my mother used to wash us. We, did, we, we went washed, our teeth went brushed. We don't, had no idea what toilet paper was uh, for a year and a half. Uh, our mother used to brush our teeth like this with, in rainwater with, with, with her finger. Uh, near the end of the war, which people saw coming, uh, it, it, it was announced that we would be put on a train. And the train, by that time, the word was out. It was no longer a secret. It meant the gas chambers, although the fact was the gas chambers had stopped operating in, in early 1944 when the Soviet uh, freed uh, Auschwitz. But we did, people didn't know that. Uh, so the, this, this transport, there were three transports, uh, uh, was actually destined for Theresienstadt, a, a camp in Czechoslovakia, uh, to be used with these hostages. It was us. Each train had two and a half thousand people, uh, and the Germans thought that they could trade uh, these skeletons and bones, again, for German POWs, or better surrender ter terms. One train made it to Theresienstadt, the other train called the Hungarian train uh, was freed by the, uh, the 73rd Armored Division, the tank division, after three or four days uh, from Bergen-Belsen. Our train after the war was named uh, the Lost Train. It disappeared uh, because the bombs were, t the, 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 the tracks were bombed uh, and the train constantly stopped. Uh, and when it stopped, again, there were 50 people to a car. They, they, the Germans opened the doors so they get the bodies out. If there was time, the bodies were, were buried in, in, in shallow graves. 600 people died on this train trip of 2,500 on the train or shortly thereafter. If the train stopped for a day, which happened, they would try to have a funeral in the sense that, that the Jews have a minion, 10 people, uh, so they, but no coffins or anything. So they were all buried along the train track. Finally, after, after on April 23rd, 1945, uh, the, tra the train stopped, but the bridge, it stopped at a, at a river's edge, but there was no bridge. The bridge had been bombed. Uh, but what was there was the Soviets, uh, and we had been liberated. And by the way, camps were not liberated, uh, or in, in the sense of the word, they were stumbled upon. The Allies never said, there's, Aus there's Auschwitz, let's go and save the Jews. Their philosophy was the best way we could help the Jews was to win the war. And there's some logic to that, but lives could have been changed. In Bergen-Belsen, a, 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 I'll just pop my cue. The, the, the British just found out there's a camp down the road. They had no idea. And so we, so we were freed. This, this last picture was we came to America on January 1st, 1947, and my, my, my parents woke us up to see the Statue of Liberty. It meant nothing to me, but, but, but 50 years later, uh, we were, my sister arranged for a tour around Manhattan for our 80th birthday, and we passed the Statue of Liberty. I said to her, let's, let's take a picture. 
and then and so we, we came to America and thrived. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sue. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Hess, uh, for joining us e this evening to share your remarkable story and to charge all of us for our responsibility to educate about the atrocities committed during World War II through the Holocaust. I'd like to thank again our friends at Toby Philanthropies for sponsoring uh, tonight's program and their continued support and partnership through the Toby Family Holocaust Education Program. Uh, those who come to our programs often may have noticed that our stage has grown. Of course, we do everything here at the National World War II Museum in a big way, uh, but this stage is really only temporary. It's for the Violins of Hope concert that we will have with the Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra tomorrow night. But I invite you to join us again uh, next week for our show, Fly, about uh, four Tuskegee Airmen and their experiences in World War II. They'll be starting on the 1st of February. You can find more information about Fly uh, on our website. Again, thank you for all for joining us tonight as we look forward to seeing you again here soon at the National World War II Museum. Thank you very much. <laughs>